fourth quarter. Nick, what's up, dude? How was Atlanta on Sunday? Well, first of all, is that a Ram check jersey? This is. This is a knockoff Chinese Ram check jersey. I wanted to honor, um, you know, honor the big boys. Uh, it was at a time when I could not spring for either a full replica or a, uh, a, a full authentic. So I went the Chinese route. It's got awkwardly small numbers. The sleeves are entirely <laughs> too long. It's got like all kinds of little imperfections. But you know what it does have? Ramchick on the back. And that's all that matters, dude. So, yes, this is a Ryan Ramchick jersey. Got to honor the O-line. All right, it's fire, man. I second, wasn't trying to uh, knock the, it at all. It's the second O-line jersey I've ever owned. The other one was a Tony Baselli Texans jersey. Pretty tight there. It would have been better if it had been Jags. But. Yeah, I know. I yeah. know. And it was after, it was after the, uh, the expansion draft and everything, and they mm -hmm. got Baselli, the jerseys were all over the stadium, whatever. Okay. Nick, what's up, dude? Let's start right with what we were kind of teasing there at the beginning. What, um, what went so wrong in the first three quarters, and what went so right in the fourth? Yeah, we'll start with uh, what went wrong. I mean, I, I think just like the timing of the offense in general, you, you could really see some guys just really on different pages. Jameis was doing one thing. Mike Thomas is doing another. There really wasn't any rhythm. I think they had some issues with protections. Um, a couple of one one-on-ones lost. A couple uh, blitzes that I think they just they didn't see well. And even in the fourth quarter, that, that remained an issue uh, on one play. Jameis almost threw that that interception on that ball to Juwan Johnson where they kind of double blitz the A-gap in, in – he just did not see it coming. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I think that, that you know, some of the stuff with the protections, too, was also on Jameis. You look at his drops, some of his drops look a little bit too deep, and that makes it a little bit harder to block. There was some tentativeness getting the ball out. But I think when they went to that that hurry up, it just kind of simplified everything, and you stopped thinking as much. And I think when Jameis kind of just was able to get into a flow, you saw the rhythm come. Guys are getting open. That first series, they're playing prevent. They're only rushing for it's kind of vanilla, but they're picking it apart. And he's doing a good job of reading safeties and, and going where he needs to go with the ball. The second drive, they started doing a little bit more coverage stuff. And again, I, I thought he made really good decisions like that. The pass to Jarvis, like he, he read the safety. They kind of were digging him out with a, a lava and kind of based on where the safety went, that's where you go with the ball. He did a really good job. Like as soon as he saw the safety declare a little bit, the ball's coming out. So Things were just happening faster, more on rhythm, and it kind of felt like when when just all the noise was taken out of it, he was able to execute a lot better, and and they got to where they needed to be. So I think there's there's a lot of stuff to feel positive about going forward. There's a few things that I think you still got to look at and you know wonder what it's going to be next week, and I think it's it's going to be you know a little bit of a of a uh, a process of getting that offense fully in sync. But I think we saw a lot of things uh, in that fourth quarter to be positive about, and it's unbelievable how, how they were able to come back, honestly. Well, Nick, one of the things that we haven't really talked about, I mean, Jameis missed a lot of time in training camp with this offense, a lot of new weapons, certainly on the outside at receiver like we've talked about, and you didn't have that time maybe to create that chemistry during training camp, and maybe it took a full half of football, three-quarters of football for them to get comfortable with each other. Yeah, I definitely. I agree with that. Uh, you know, especially in the case of Mike, like just on some of those plays, like the ball's just behind him and Mike's yeah. cutting somewhere else. So it's just kind of like they got to get used to to doing that stuff and reading body language and knowing where to go with the ball and how to throw it on rhythm. And, and yeah, it takes some time to do it. You know, I was talking to somebody that uh, used to work at Michigan football and he had an interesting theory. Like he said, watch all the games this week and all the teams that are rebuilding seem to have an advantage because they're treating the preseason seriously and all the teams that are good don't and then they come into these games and none of them look like they're in rhythm and i think you even saw it last night in the, yep. the monday night game like seattle looked like a, a well-oiled machine because they have to be they have to figure out how to win and if you're denver you're the saints you're, you're some of these other teams you do what you got to do to kind of be ready and then you, you ramp up a little bit during the season and that's just kind of the way football's become across the board so yeah i think i think it probably took some time to get there and then you know, Jameis said it after the game, and I thought it was his most interesting comment. He's like, you know, once we went to hurry up, I was just able to go out there and play ball. And yeah. it just seemed like he, he was really comfortable in that moment, and it didn't matter who he was throwing to or what the chemistry was. He was just going to execute. And once he was in that mind frame, he, he made it work. So I think that was important for him, important for the receivers, just to have that success. They can grab onto it. You look at the first three quarters, figure out what went wrong, but knowing that you can go in the game, things can be really bad, and you can dig your way out. That's important because these guys have never played together, the, the top three receivers in Jameis. So a very, very good learning experience for them. 
Yeah, I mean, that that, that was the quote. But that does beg the question, right? Because he said it. he even went on to be like, you know, no game plan, no nothing, just going out there and, and, and playing. So how do you then bring that into the game plan, right? So when it doesn't require end-of-game situations or the defense kind of like, because you're not going to go hurry up the entire game. Maybe you do work in more tempo. But, but yeah, how, how do you bring some of that instinctive success to the more regimented portions of the game? I think it's just what Jake said, man. They just got to get comfortable together. And then mm-hmm. once once there's that confidence and all that, it's it's going to feel the same way as that. There's going to be less thinking because you've been through everything. You've had the reps. You know where guys are going to be. And then it's just all going to be second nature. So, yeah, I, you know, I think missing that time is is kind of a, a big deal. And it, it's something that they made up for in that process. As far as the tempo stuff, I've been asking for seven years why they don't do more of it. Huh. Like you got to find ways, I think, to just kind of bring that in. I, I think it's like the most deadly offensive package in the NFL. And it doesn't matter who's running it. It just always works. Guys are always open. And it, it's just something that uh, they've done really, really well over the years. Um, you know, the Patriots used to do like a one word turbo offense. They yeah. kind of stole it from Chip Kelly and they would do that. Uh, 2010, I think the, the first year that, that Hernandez and Gronk were like taking over the league, like that's how they ran their offense. And the Saints have versatile players too. Like they could get people trapped out there. Like Taysom Hill could be like the most deadly hurry up weapon in the league. If you get them with an extra defensive back, you just run it down their throat and dominate them that way. If you get them trapped with a linebacker, you send Taysom out on routes and he's running by them and you got a mismatch somewhere. Like there's a lot of stuff they could do. I, I would be interested to see if they ever uh, brought that in, but I, I don't, I don't think that's a dream that's ever going to come to fruition. You could even do a Mark Ingram direct snap. Yeah, that? or maybe not. <laughs> hey, I was going to say, I mean, to your point, uh, Nick, about one word, hurry up offense. When I was in Denver with Peyton, we had zero through 10. And it was a quarterback, whatever like famous quarterback wore the number, that was our NASCAR pace. And we would get up to the line and we would just say three, four, 10, whatever it was. Or we would say the name of the quarterback, like Warren Moon was number one. We would just get up to the line, like Moon, Moon, Moon. And it was a whole formation I mean, it could have motion in it, and you knew the uh, the route uh, concepts as well. And so, yeah, that's something you have to use to your advantage. You can get up there, say literally one jersey number, one word, and everyone knows what it is. And it's not something that's very difficult to remember if you're just going zero through ten. Yeah. So the Saints used hand signals, and and unfortunately, if you like watch games from 2009 and watch games from like two years ago, some of the hand signals are, are still the same. You can see mm. them on the broadcast, and mm. those uh. I'm guessing they've probably changed at some point because I wrote an article about it uh, not too long ago. But like you, you can kind of go through and, and some of these hand signals, it's still the same stuff. But yeah, it, it's it's the same thing. It's the same. Hurry up, everybody! It's knows so easy to doing. steal hand the signals too. It's so if James easy. is acting like or yeah. well, Drew, if Drew was acting like he was putting lotion on his arm, that's one play. There's one where they kind of cup their hands. Like they, there's a handful of yeah. them, and uh, yeah, I mean it's just it's just something they got to be able to hurry up and go. And I, you know, I think it's just it's beneficial it just cuts down like like james said on on all that thinking guys just lock in do what they got to do and it takes the noise out and I, you know i think it was it was desperately needed uh in that situation because you know i i'm not putting everything on him like the blitz and all that was bad guys weren't getting open at, at sometimes but like there were a few plays where, where you just kind of saw james like and you could see like the extra second of thinking like is this where he's going to be should i go with the ball yeah that extra clutch and then all of a sudden pressure's on him so He's just got to get to that place. He's going to get there. I think that experience was so, so good for him. We saw it last year. He was getting to that place. So I think it's just him getting back in rhythm first game in a year. Um, and then once he felt it off, he went. Yeah, I mean, he had an entire offseason of narrative hanging over his head uh, going into that fourth quarter, and he kind of erased it all. And uh, and it was great. Like, look, physically now you know Jameis can make all the throws, right? I mean, the back shoulders, Thomas were excellent. The diving catch by Thomas was perfectly placed. Uh, I think I saw a tweet from you, Nick, that the Landry catch instead of the game winner went 58 yards through the air. Uh, so physically, Jameis can do it all. And now, yeah. Keeley, he has the weapons with which to take advantage of those physical talents. How big of a deal is it, Nick, uh, that you saw Mike Thomas come back in the way that he did first game in what feels like a couple of years and 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 come out with two touchdowns on the other end? It- well, first of all, like just the weapons overall watching that game, like that was the first time in a while, like where I was watching it, I was like, man, they can actually come back. Like yeah. I actually believe because they actually had the weapons. And then even when they had that intentional grounding, that would have buried the team before. Like, and it didn't feel like a big deal. It's just, okay, Jameis has a huge arm and he has good receivers. They're, yeah. they're going to get 
they're going to get the yardage they need to to do what they got to do. So that's just a major difference. And if you're watching the game feeling that, like imagine what the relief he's feeling yeah. after what he went through last year with these guys being in these situations. And then he's the one that takes, you know, as you said, the narrative is all on him then when, when things don't go well. And it wasn't necessarily always his fault. Mike Thomas, I mean, I, I think more than anyone finding some of that success in the fourth quarter was huge for him. Like, I can't imagine the, the, you know, the, the weight of the last two years. And then you go through a game. If, if he hadn't had a catch or any success, you know, that's a whole nother week. You got to wait. And now you're going against a team like where things ended. And it's just, you know, a lot of pressure I think would have been on him. So for him just to, to do that, to feel it, to get in the end zone twice, to be able to stand at that podium after the game with the shades on and feeling like he was a man. I, I think that was a huge deal for him. And uh, yeah, you know, I think that was the mic in the fourth quarter that, we kind of saw all summer he started to take over, be dominant. You saw the physical traits. Same stuff right there. Like, you can't defend him on some of those fades, man. It's just – it's a cheat code. That's snatched. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah, so good to have weapons like that. Back, hey, I want to go to the other side of the football with you, Nick. Pete Warner, just on the TV copy. I've not watched the Pro Football Focus film yet, but on the TV copy, it looked like he had a big day, and I know the Saints are counting on him. That's why they didn't go out and re-sign or sign another veteran player at that position. I thought he I thought he played really great. I mean, there were a couple of plays that, that you'd probably take back, but in a game like that, against that read option, it's just being disciplined, being in the right places, having good eyes. He wasn't getting fooled. He made a bunch of key plays. He had that that stop, uh, second down, I think, loss of yardage. It pretty much kind of set up the uh the Saints to be able to win the game. So I thought I thought he was huge in it. Uh, even when he got matched up on Zacchaeus, you know, he got smoked on the route but stayed with it long enough to to force a fumble. Like yeah. he's He's got more speed and range than I think a lot of people want to give him credit for. And you kind of saw on that play in a really bad matchup. So I think he's he's key for them. I mean, I thought he was he was one of the better players on defense. Him and Honey Badger, I thought, were probably the the two best guys on the defense. Hey, Nick, what about um oh, at, the, at the end there with the intentional grounding? Uh, help me out with the mechanics of a call like that. Why was like, should that have been reviewed? Because because he was clearly down in bounds and touched. Like, what are the mechanics there that are supposed to protect the Saints from doing? Like, like Jameis did the right thing because he was inbound and touched, but the refs had called him out and stopped the clock. Should he have known? Should the booth have reviewed it since it was under two minutes? How 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 do you kind of undo that knot? Yeah. So I don't I don't. I'm not criticizing for what happened because they acted in the manner of things being called correctly. So it's hard to kind of criticize it. On the other hand, like you just got to glance up at the clock, I think, and, and kind of know. Well, like and, I, dude, I thought the clock operator had screwed up. Like I was watching the TV broadcast and the clock wasn't running. And I was like, oh, they're going to fix that. And the refs are going to be like, actually, there should be 20. But no, I guess. Yeah, I guess not. I don't know. Yeah. And it, and it kind of felt like they were hurrying to get the ball set too. So like, there was just like a lot of things happening that, that made it feel like, okay, clock the ball. But I mean, it, it's just something where where I think the officials have, have made enough bad calls that you can't assume anything is is going to be right, and that's a hard way to live. But I mean, I think that's just the reality of the situation. The one that I thought was, you know, a little that that actually is the talking point is Ugh. they clock they clock the ball way too early on that on the last <laughs> one. Like you got to let it run down. Like you can't you can't give them a chance to get back out on the field. But look, I mean, it's a good point. New staff, new new you know QBs in his first game, and a, and he, like it's just gonna it's a good it's a good situation to take your lumps. You know, you win the game. None of this stuff ultimately matters. Now you know, and I don't expect any of that stuff to to happen again. But I mean, you know, the coaching staff owned it. They they said they they got to handle all that stuff better at the end of the game. And you know, yeah, you definitely just can't give them a, a chance to have a possession when you're kicking the game winning field goal. Uh, that's a great point. I haven't even actually considered yet. Uh, I mean, hey, how about Jarvis Landry, dude? Immediately paying dividends. I mean, he looked like a man after the game, a bit overcome with emotion. Looked like a man finally freed from the NFL purgatory in which he's been forced to exist for a couple of years this year. Uh, what 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 do you think about what you saw to Jarvis? I mean, he just he feels like a, a absolute steal. Like if he does nothing else this year, I think he earned his three million dollars in this one game. Like, <laughs> he, he, gave, he gave him a win. So I mean. I don't know what one win's worth, but it seems like guys get paid a lot to to deliver wins. So, Fair. yeah, I mean, I think he's he's going to be really, really good for them. He's a steady guy. He's healthy. You, you see it. I mean, the downfield ability, him, like, there's some stuff to be unlocked there. I think Mike Thomas has some as well that, that's going to come out playing with a guy like Jameis, you know, being able to just use their their bodies to make physical Anquan Bolden-type catches a little further down the field. So I think uh, – 
there's a lot there. But yeah, I think it's it's very possible that he ends up being the steal of the off season, and he's definitely going to get the money uh, that that he wants yeah. next off season. All right, if anybody knows this, it's going to be you, Nick. He switches from number eighty. He wore eighty at Lutcher. He wore it at LSU. He wore it with Cleveland. He was 80 with the Saints, switches to number five. Hmm. Was there any reason? I mean, he's always been number 80 outside of his time with the Dolphins, where he's, I believe, 14. Yeah, so he he, he wore 80 for his brother, and he just he, he's done it his whole career. And just being here, he, he said he wanted to, to do something for himself. So oh, he, wow. he went to five, and okay. so five's the number. I knew yeah, he knew. I mean, look, emerge, right? It's kind of a new, like you said, a new year, new him, prove it that he can still ball. And that's his quest. And this, we have now entered the five era of Jarvis Landry. It's off to hell start. Okay, Nick, I'm going to leave you with a stat of the day that I'm sure you might've seen over the past three seasons, NFL teams leading by 15 points in the fourth quarter are 240. And this is excluding the Falcons are 245, two and one. The Atlanta Falcons, when leading by 15 in the fourth, are 5-3. and three. Oh, 200, 245, 2-1 two and one to 5-3. and three. <laughs> Y'all, that's, they, they are a literal walking mathematical anomaly. I mean, it's it a is crazy snap of third and one. It's just wild, Nick. They change their, their team, too. The roster changes. It's new coaches, <laughs> new players, and like they just can't, they can't shake this thing. It's unbelievable. Uh, Nick, have a great day, man. We kept you long. You have an excellent morning. New Orleans up football is the site. Hey, let me see something real quick. Thursday morning, yeah. 10 a.m., special edition, special announcement on our podcast on OF TV. Check it out. Okay, great. 10 a.m. We think we're going to change the game too. a little. We love the time, too. 10 a.m., big announcement. Go check it out. Uh, Nick, and then we'll talk to you about it next Tuesday, man.